Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be here to talk about Mariah Mitchell and my ladies at the Harvard Observatory, upon whom she had tremendous influence. Okay, I'm going to read you a quote from Mariah Mitchell. This is one of her entries about a night spent observing. I swept, uh, February 12th, 1855. I swept around for comets about an hour, and then I amused myself with noticing the varieties of color. I wonder that I have so long been insensible to this charm in the skies. The tints of the different stars are so delicate in their variety. What a pity that some of our manufacturers shouldn't be able to steal the secret of dye stuffs from the stars. Although Mariah's discovery of a comet and her world fame as a result of Miss Mitchell's comet in 1847, she went to teach at Vassar College, and she taught some of the women who wound up working at Harvard. And she had other influences as well. And her own world fame depended partly on her friendship with the director at Harvard. Because when Mariah's father told the Bonds, William Cranch Bond and his son George Phillips Bond, that Mariah had discovered a comet, they wrote about her discovery to the King of Denmark. And there was a rival claim for the gold medal that was ultimately awarded to Mariah. So she had a connection to the Harvard Observatory, even though she herself didn't work there. And uh, here is a group of women who did. And so the, um, the photographs made this kind of work possible for them because then they didn't have to be up in the night with the men, which would have been unseemly. Uh, so the men would take the photographs through the telescopes at night, and then the women would study them in the daytime using, using this kind of, of light frame. So you, you have the plate set in that wooden frame, and then at the bottom is a mirror, and that catches daylight from the open window and bounces it up through the plate, and then they are examining the image on the plate with usually a magnifying glass. The woman at the back is using a modified microscope to look at the images. And I'll show you some of the uh, plates, the types of imagery that was captured on them. So here, here is a modern woman astronomer. This is Wendy Friedman, who is now at the University of Chicago. But I interviewed her about 25 years ago for a profile in a popular magazine. And she, at the time, was in charge of a Hubble telescope key project about the expansion rate of the universe. And she told me that almost everything she was doing depended on the work of a woman who had lived 100 years ago named Henrietta Swan Levitt. Here she is. And Miss Levitt figured out a way to tell distances in space, which is a very difficult thing to do. We've all had the experience of looking up at the night sky. Some things are bright, some things are dim. But you really can't tell how far away anything is. And you don't know whether the bright things are bright because they're close or because they are actually much brighter than anything else. And she was one of the people who helped solve that problem. So I'd never heard of her before. I thought it was quite remarkable that somebody from so long ago was somehow involved with the Hubble Space Telescope Key Project. And then when I went to learn more about her, it turned out she was working in this room full of women at Harvard, which was even more remarkable. Because one doesn't think of Harvard as being especially friendly to women, let alone in the 1800s. So I thought, this is a fantastic story. And someday I'm going to get around to telling this story. Uh, here they are. This, um, this picture is 
uh, from 1917. And uh, no disrespect was meant by this pose. This is called the paper doll photo for obvious reasons. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how many women at a time were there working at Harvard. Uh, here is Ms. Levitt, and we'll talk more about the others later. So this is the observatory building, and it includes a residence. So you, you can see two domes for telescopes, but then there's a part of the building that just has chimneys. And the director lived on site. So it was very easy to rope his family members into doing work at the observatory. And that's how the first women got started. They were the wives, sisters, daughters of the resident astronomer. And, um, and they, did, they did extremely well. Um, but I do want to say that I have another quote from Mariah Mitchell to read to you. Their first work, the wives, sisters, and daughters, mostly worked as computers. So computer used to be a job description, not a machine. And observatories always needed computers to do the math, to reduce observations, to calculate the orbits of comets, asteroids. So there was a lot of computing work. And Ms. Mitchell herself was a computer for the Coast Survey. So she knew about that work. And um, this is what, how she described it. In the half-lighted and wholly unventilated offices, women work patiently at the formulae and pile up logarithmic figures. In the open air, under the blue sky or the starlit canopy, Boys and men make the measure. So she was sensitive to an unfair division of labor. But as you can see at Harvard, this was hardly a dimly lit, unventilated room. Things really changed. And the importance of the work with the photographic plates created an opportunity to hire many women at a time. It already demonstrated. They could do the work at an observatory, and they had the added advantage of being cheap. And the director saw this project as hugely important and wanted as many pairs of eyes on the glass plates as he could get, and so it made sense to hire women. Uh, this was the big telescope at Harvard under the uh, large dome, the 15-inch telescope. So smaller diameter than the one that's here at the Mariah Mitchell Observatory. But this telescope took the first ever photograph of a star. And photography didn't continue. That was in 1850. Photography didn't continue with this instrument because the instrument wasn't designed for taking photographs. It was designed for looking through. So it wasn't until 25 years later with other telescopes purchased expressly for the purpose that the serious photography project got underway. And uh, here's one of the early plates. So many of you will recognize the Orion constellation. And uh, this little object in here that looks like a horse's head, the Horsehead Nebula, was noticed on this plate. And this woman was the one who identified it, Williamina Fleming. She had come to this country from Scotland as a young bride and not too long afterward found herself alone and pregnant and desperate. And so she took a job at the observatory as a domestic servant in the residence. And the director, Edward Charles Pickering, recognized how smart she was and moved her over to the observatory and taught her how to look at the glass plates, how to do the mathematical computations, and then helped her go home to Scotland to have her baby. And she was so grateful 
that she named the baby Edward Charles Pickering Fleming. And uh, the Pickerings promised her a real job if she would come back. So after two years home with her mother and grandmother, she came back and she worked at the observatory the rest of her life. And she was the first woman to earn a Harvard University title. She was the curator of astronomical photographs. And when the little boy was about seven, she brought him over and she put him through MIT. Uh, Mrs. Fleming was multi-talented. She liked to make dolls. She often made astronomical theme dolls, pairs of dolls that were particular double stars. But she also liked to do dolls in traditional Highland costume. Um, so this gives me occasion to read you another quote from Mariah Mitchell. Observations of this kind, astronomical observations, are peculiarly adapted to women. Indeed, all astronomical observing seems to be so fitted. The training of a girl fits her for delicate work. The touch of her fingers upon the delicate screws of an astronomical instrument might become wonderfully accurate in results. A woman's eyes are trained to nicety of color. The eye that directs a needle in the delicate meshes of embroidery will equally well bisect a star with the spider web of the micrometer. Routine observations, too, dull as they are, are less dull than the endless repetition of the same pattern of crochet work. Amen. So here's another doll. This is the Henrietta Leavitt doll. Uh, there is only one. This was handmade by the parents of a very serious amateur astronomer named Alice Envoltson. And her parents took a, an American girl doll and suited it up as Henrietta Leavitt. And the skirt is made from the dress that Alice wore to her senior prom. So it has a lot of personal uh, significance. But Henrietta has all the accoutrements of her work. So here is the little light lectern to be used for studying the stars uh, with the miniature instruments in it, magnifying glass, and another that I'll tell you about later. And here in this folder are miniature reproductions of the, the photographic plates that she studied and the scientific papers that she wrote. Uh, but here we are back in the observing room. So this is, this is Edward Pickering, the director. And uh, here's Mrs. Fleming, who, who really had charge of the other women. Mrs. Fleming did not have a college education. None of the first women who worked at the observatory had a college education, nor did Mariah Mitchell. But they were nevertheless well-educated and, uh, and very smart with numbers. And uh, did I already say that Mrs. Fleming had charge of hiring people and training them? So she really had a, a position of tremendous authority. These are Mariah Mitchell's students at Vassar. So her fame from discovering a comet got her this job as professor of astronomy at Vassar College, where she had a tremendous influence, not only on her students, but it gave her a platform to speak for women's education. Because even in the 1870s, she was near the end of her career, was still questioned whether it was worth educating young women and whether it would actually be detrimental to their health. There was an idea that if a young woman studied too hard at that age, that her reproductive organs would atrophy. And uh, you know, this, this was disproven by interviewing college-educated women and discovering that, in fact, they had had children. Um, but this was the kind of, of prejudice that, that people were still uh, fighting against. And uh, Ms. Mitchell did not just stay at Vassar, but when there was something important to see, like an eclipse, she would 
pack up a few of the students and travel to wherever, whether that was Colorado, as, as in this uh, picture. Uh, she also took them to observe the transit of Venus. And she was one of the first astronomers who was taking pictures of the sun every day. And that's the way important discoveries got made, by photographing the same areas over and over through time so you could, you could observe change happening. Um, the work at Harvard was not only done by women, but it was funded mostly by women. Uh, and this woman, Anna Palmer Draper, was uh, one of the major uh, benefactresses. She was married to Dr. Henry Draper, and they were amateur astronomers. But really, the term just means they loved what they did. Henry Draper built some of the finest telescopes in the world uh, in his day. And when the two of them married, they spent their honeymoon shopping for a glass blank to make a telescope mirror and then building the telescope. And so she was his partner in, in all his astronomical work. And he made a, a tremendous advance in taking the first photograph of the spectrum of a star. So this is a, a textbook image of a stellar spectrum. You get the starlight spread out into its colors and the, uh, the black lines that help indicate what chemicals are present in the stars. And this was a revelation, the, the spectral analysis. People had always thought, we'll never know what the stars are made of. They're too far away. Uh, it'd be impossible to get a sample. But by, by spreading out the star's light, Henry Draper liked to say, that had made the chemist's arms millions of miles long. And by looking at the spectra, seeing whether the, the, the lines got shifted toward the red or toward the blue, that would tell you information about the motion of the object you were looking at. Uh, of course, there was no color photography. The best of his pictures looked like this. But they were so important, so revelatory. Without the photographs, you would have to be looking at the spectrum through a telescope and a spectroscope in real time and making a drawing. And that just wasn't as precise as taking a photograph. So Henry and Anna Draper decided to drop everything else they were doing. He was a medical doctor. He was teaching at NYU. They were going to completely devote themselves to this project, to photographing the spectra of the stars and then creating a classification system so people could understand the, uh, the taxonomy of the heavens. And just when they got their lives in order to do this, they had a little private observatory up uh, about 20 miles north of New York City. And uh, just at that point, when they were ready to start, he developed pneumonia and died at age 45. So she was uh, heartbroken. She is in her widow's garb and decided to, uh, she really wanted to see his dream realized somehow. She thought she could do the work herself with a couple of assistants, but she wasn't able to get the right kind of help. So she turned to Edward Pickering at Harvard, who was a friend of theirs, and said, if you will do this work, in my husband's name, I will give you my personal fortune. And, uh, and she did. She wrote him a check for $10,000 to get started, which about tripled the operating budget of the observatory. And then she kept that up for 30 years. Um, Mrs. Draper and, and, and Dr. Draper attended that same total solar eclipse, uh, the 1878 total solar eclipse that Mariah Mitchell traveled to Colorado to see. So here they, here they are. And that is Thomas Edison, who was uh, another friend of theirs. So 
when Pickering took over the project of photographing the spectra, he didn't want to do one star at a time. He was in a big hurry. So he thought, well, we'll move the prism to a different part of the telescope, and we'll get hundreds of spectra on every plate. So each little smudge, each of those smudges is the spectrum of a star. And he turned this over to the women. Look at these patterns and see what you can figure out from those patterns and come up with a system to classify the stars. And they did it. And when you look at this plate, you see why they needed magnifying glasses and microscopes. But from the patterns of lines, Mrs. Fleming established a classification system. And she named the objects with the letters of the alphabet. And it was all very logical, uh, not really based on science yet, but they figured eventually they would be able to tell why there were different categories. Um, so here's Miss Mitchell teaching at Vassar with her students. And she taught this young woman, Antonia Mori, was the first woman to come work at Harvard who was a college graduate. And she had been Ms. Mitchell's student for several semesters of astronomy. And um, you know that Ms. Mitchell used to have a dome party and, and she would write verses for her students. And she would also challenge them to write little verses. And I have Ms. Ms. Morey's poem. Um, she wasn't really a great poet. I'm not sure I'm going to read it to you. But later, if we have time, I might give you a taste of it. But uh, Miss Morey was, she was not only a college graduate, student of Mariah Mitchell's, she was Henry Draper's niece. And she was a distant cousin of Matthew Fontaine Morey, um, Pathfinder of the Sea. So she didn't like Mrs. Draper's, I mean, Mrs. Fleming's classification system. And she came up with her own classification system. And um, for, for a while, there were several of, here, here she is at Harvard um, with her magnifying glass. In addition to the classification system, she also uh, made this important discovery by looking at the spectrum of a particular star. She was able to tell that it was really two stars so close together that they couldn't be seen as two separate stars through the telescope. But by the spectrum, that became clear. So that made her very famous very quickly. Um, this is the Vassar Observatory, where Ms. Mitchell taught. And then the very cozy room inside, where they would gather uh, when the weather was bad, just to have a conversation. She was very much a. Uh, an emotional support to her students. And, uh, and that's where they had the dome parties. Annie Jump Cannon was a Wellesley graduate. But, uh, she, and she was the first woman to work at Harvard who really had telescope experience. And from the beginning was not only looking at the glass plates, but actually observing stars on the roof of the observatory, variable stars, looking for stars that change their brightness over time, and then trying to judge their brightness. It was another big project at the observatory, was to figure out the relative brightness of all the stars and put it on a firm basis of using a, the same scale every time. So much was just in the eye of the beholder in the 19th century. Lots of work needed to be done to standardize practices and um, bases of measurement. So Miss Cannon took over the classification system, and she saw the best in each one and had her own view of which stars should come first. So she had to juggle the alphabet. And it's because of her that the letters of the stars go O, B, A, F, G, K, M, which generations of astronomy students have memorized with the mnemonic, O, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. And that is thanks to Miss Cannon. Uh, 
Fortunately for me, Ms. Cannon was a lifelong diarist, something she had in common with Ms. Mitchell. And um, she had some of the same handwriting uh, peculiarities. Actually, I think Ms. Cannon's handwriting is a lot worse. But they both tended to cross the T somewhere far beyond the T. Ms. Mitchell actually crossed the H, the L. And in Ms. Cannon's writing, the cross would be into the next word. Uh, but she really did keep track of things over all that time. And um, here's, here's one more quote from Ms. Mitchell that I want to read you about the spectrum, which is so full of starry information. The astronomer breaks up the starlight just as the geologist breaks up the rock with his hammer. And with similar results, he finds copper, sodium, and other elements in sun and stars. If you look at the beautiful ribbon of colors which a ray of sunlight gives when passed through a prism, you see that it is crossed by dark bands, sometimes single, sometimes crowded close together. Each of these is a black-lettered message from the sun. This is one of Miss Cannon's plates. Shows her way of working. So again, every little smudge is the spectrum of a star. So she would write on the plate. That was another beauty of these plates. There's photographic emulsion on one side. You don't touch that. But on the smooth glass side, you can write anything you like. You can point out something you think is significant that you want to share to, with the others in your group. Or you can number all the objects, which is what's going on here. And then she'd be looking at the plate at her light lectern and calling out to an assistant, number such and such, letter B. Number such and such, letter K. And she was so fast. Nobody could understand how she could make a judgment as quickly as she did. Uh, and, and it was thought that she didn't know either. She just recognized them right away. So kind of work is obviously not for everyone. Um, the Harvard group, in order to photograph all the stars, they had to build a, an observatory in the Southern Hemisphere because uh, although the Earth turns and you can see everything around uh, in the north from Cambridge, you can't see the southern stars unless you go there. So they um, found this spot near Arequipa, Peru, uh, in the lee of a volcano, which was thought to be extinct. Turned out it was only dormant, but nothing terrible happened. And uh, several of these buildings have telescopes. But um, the one that looks most like a, an observatory, the one with the dome, is um, thanks to another female. Uh, whoops. Well, I'm going to talk about this first. Um, back in the dome, this, um, this one, they needed a special telescope for a telescope built especially for astrophotography. Uh, that would take very big plates, and they needed $50,000 to build it. And a woman named Catherine Wolf Bruce in New York uh, just got interested in astronomy and volunteered to pay the whole $50,000. So looking at those big plates, those were the plates that Miss Levitt used to make her discovery of, of how to tell distances in space. Mostly what she worked on though, was the, the project of determining the brightness of all the stars. And these were the tools she used. These are called fly spankers because they look like fly swatters, but they're very tiny. They're only about three inches long. So her joke was that they were too small to do a fly much damage and they could only spank it. Uh, and each one contains a a piece of a glass plate that shows some number of stars. 
And on this little guide, someone has already assigned a brightness number to each star. So you can use this to examine a new plate. You, you move that over the plate and compare the stars in the fly spanker with the stars on the plate, and that will help you assign a brightness number to them. This is the Bruce telescope. Thank you. Uh, the uh, the $50,000 telescope that was um, built by yet another heiress interested in astronomy. Pickering was very charming, very good at attracting these wealthy women to support his uh, project. Um, these are the founders of the Mariah Mitchell Association. I, I wish I knew which one was Lydia Swain Hinchman, Lydia Swain Mitchell Hinchman. Um, and maybe one of you knows and can tell me. But these women worked very closely with Pickering and with the women at the Harvard Observatory uh, because they wanted a woman astronomer to come to Nantucket and lecture and give courses to the local people who were interested. And uh, so there was a lot of back and forth, and Pickering advised about what sort of telescope would be appropriate, what sort of research project could best be done here, and uh, was a very fruitful friendship. And uh, Mrs. Hinchman set up a special fellowship that would pay for one of the Harvard women to come here to Nantucket for six months out of the year and have open observing nights, do her own research, teach those who were interested in learning about astronomy, and, and generally improve the community. And uh, this was the first Mariah Mitchell Association fellow to fill that position, Margaret Harwood. She, had, she was a Radcliffe graduate. She already had a master's degree uh, in astronomy and um, came here, warmed to the task. Everybody loved her. They, they loved her so much that they didn't want to bring in a new person the next year. They almost immediately wanted to make her the permanent fellow. And um, she was being offered a job uh, at, at Wellesley. So the Nantucket group quickly met the Wellesley offer and asked her to just come and be the permanent director. And she was director here for more than 40 years and had tremendous influence, but still went back and forth and continued her collaboration with the women at Harvard and brought a lot of them here as guest lecturers, visitors, visiting researchers. Uh, so here she is back at Harvard. Here's Pickering. And here's Miss Harwood uh, with, with the other members of the group. This is Annie Cannon. Won't point out everybody. But it was a, was a, a very, very friendly back and forth. So here's the, uh, the building you all know very well, where she spent such happy time. Yet another image of her. And you can see how she aged over the course of her, her job. But in this picture, she's, um, she's speaking with her assistant, uh, Margaret Walton Mayall, who also spent a lot of time here, and Harlow Shapley, who was Pickering's successor at Harvard. And she, um, in bringing in guest lecturers, she had to advise them about what was appropriate for a Nantucket audience. So I want to read you her instructions to someone. This, this was somebody who wanted to come talk about navigation. She said, the feelings of others concur with mine that a lecture on navigation would not be popular with the Nantucket people. 
Anything else astronomical would please, I feel sure. But there is an inborn feeling that they know all there is to know about everything connected with the sea. And why listen to anyone else on the subject? To illustrate the feeling, some years ago, a man came to lecture on whales, W-H-A-L-E-S. Many of the old inhabitants, including sea captains, went expecting to hear a description of whales, W, capital W, A-L-E-S. And when the lecturer began to explain the anatomy of the whale, the old whalers talked back, made much fun, and there was a general rumpus. So um, Mrs. Hinchman, over the years, after the initial fellowship that brought Margaret Harwood here, she and her husband funded several other fellowships so that there were more and more Harvard women coming here working for six months, and then being able, with all that experience, to go work at some observatory elsewhere. And um, one of the fellowships became known as the Pickering Memorial Fellowship for Women, as a way to thank him for always being such a booster of, of women in science. And after Pickering's death, when Shapley took over, Shapley wanted to start a graduate program because the observatory was really just in the, in the business of producing knowledge. They weren't training the future generation enough. And to uh, really have a graduate program and graduate student, he needed graduate student fellowships. And the only money were these Pickering fellowships for women. So the whole first few graduating graduate level classes of astronomers were recruited from the women's colleges. So the first one was um, oops, uh, Adelaide Ames from Vassar. So again, Vassar, Mariah, Mariah Mitchell was long gone when Adelaide Ames studied there, but her, her fame lived on. Uh, Helen Sawyer from Mount Holyoke and Cecilia Payne, who came from Cambridge University in England, where she'd been told there was no future for her as an astronomer in that country. Uh, she did really well here. She wanted to come here not only because of the opportunities for women and the Pickering Fellowship, which was again thanks to the Mariah Mitchell Association, um, but she wanted to work with the glass plates she had an idea that she could figure out the actual proportion of the different chemical elements in the stars. And that's what she worked on. She was the first person to get a PhD in astronomy from Harvard University. And that was her project. And in the course of doing the work, she kept coming up with the result that it was almost entirely hydrogen, which nobody was expecting. There were, there were so many elements in the stars in common with earthly elements that there was an expectation that the proportions would be similar. And she, said, I, and she reported this in her thesis that, yeah, I know it sounds strange and maybe it's wrong, but it seems to me that hydrogen is about a million times more prevalent than anything else. And her thesis was published in 1925, and it took only four years for the entire astronomical community to come around to say, you know what, it really is almost entirely hydrogen. Um, more of Miss Mitchell's influence. This, this is a portrait of the first female PhD recipients at Yale University. And this person is Margareta Palmer who was Antonia Mori's classmate, and they both studied astronomy with Mariah Mitchell at Vassar. And Margareta Palmer got her PhD at Yale, actually in mathematics, but her thesis was the determination of the orbit of Miss Mitchell's comet. This is Dorit Hofflet, who became director after Margaret Harwood, and uh, also had a long career here. 
And I have to say, there's, there, there's a myth about the Harvard computers that the reason Pickering hired so many women was that he just got disgusted with one of his, that there were no women working there beforehand. And one day he got really disgusted with his male assistants and said, your work is so sloppy. My maid could do a better job. And that, that was how he brought in Mrs. Fleming and then all the other women. And this is, this is one of those myths that's almost impossible to kill, but I have traced it to Dorit Hoffman. So, just so you know. Also, I, 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 in the course of writing my book, I read through the observatory correspondence. And Pickering was the most polite person who ever lived. So the thought that he would ever embarrass an underling by dressing him down in front of others, it couldn't have happened. How many people have seen the movie Hidden Figures? So it was remarkable to me that in one year there could be three books about women computers, uh, but there were. And the Harvard ladies were the grandmothers of all the others because it was that precedent. You know, they not only worked at Harvard and became world famous for what they did, but they infiltrated all the other observatories. So this precedent of bringing women in to do the computational work was set before the uh, uh, Langley uh, situation rose. And the Hidden Figures story really captured the public attention because they were, they were black computers and they were segregated from the white computers. So um, that was a story. The problem with these later, and there was, there was also the rise of the Rocket Girls, the, uh, the women who worked at the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, that book also came out in 2016. But the, the Langley women really were computers. And when machine computers came in, they had to learn programming, or they were out of a job. Whereas at Harvard, the first ones were hired as computers, but as soon as they had the plate, they were doing astronomy. They were making discoveries, classifying the stars, ascertaining the brightness of the stars, finding objects that had never been seen before, and really gaining national and international recognition for their work. So um, and, and Mrs. Fleming, uh, quite a few of them are buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery near Harvard. And Mrs. Fleming's tombstone just has her name and the date, the year of her birth and death, and the word astronomer. Um, this is Alyssa Goodman, who's professor of astronomy at Harvard now. And she was one of the people I asked to read my manuscript as a technical expert. And she got completely sidetracked by the story of the women and ignored the astronomy almost completely. Uh, it's a good thing I had other people reading behind her. Um, she said, you know, I've always heard about all of them, and, but somehow I thought they were just doing something cute or quaint. I didn't realize they were actually doing science. And um, that made me sad because I... I think it's a kind of um, internal misogyny that a lot of women have without being aware of it. Um, that there's a sense that if a, if a woman does something, it couldn't really have been that difficult to begin with. Uh, so she, anyway, she was thrilled to see how much they had actually accomplished. And she said, you have to come up here and teach us our history. And she arranged for me to have my book launch party in the observatory, which was really a thrill. Um, so, uh, Miss Levitt in the dark dress, Miss Cannon in the light, and uh, um, it, it's almost impossible to overestimate how famous they were in their own lifetimes. Uh, Miss Cannon got several honorary degrees including one from Oxford in England, who's the first woman to get an honorary doctor of science from them. They were members of the American Astronomical 
Society. They were members of the Mariah Mitchell Association. Um, and they were also foreign members of Royal Astronomical Society and other uh, established scientific organizations. Miss Cannon was not only a member of the American Astronomical Society, but an officer. And uh, Miss Levitt was being considered for a Nobel Prize. Uh, but by the time an actual nomination was being considered, she had died, and the Nobel Prize is not awarded posthumously, so that never happened. Um, Miss Cannon, in her old age, won a very important prize for women in science, the Ellen Swallow Richards Prize. Ellen Swallow Richards was... Um, a student, another student of Mariah Mitchell's, who uh, went on to teach at MIT and become a very uh, famous scientist, someone who could analyze the uh, health water, very important series of uh, tests that she developed. And so there was this Ellen Swallow Richards Prize for a woman scientist, and it was awarded to Annie Jump Cannon. And then the group awarding the Ellen Swallow Richards Prize disbanded. Said, okay, there are now lots of women in science. We don't need this prize anymore. And Miss Cannon thought that really wasn't the case. And so instead of spending the money, she used it to endow the Annie Jump Cannon Prize for Women in Astronomy. And uh, her idea was that not only would you give some money, but you would give the person a lovely pin or necklace that would be specifically designed on an astronomical theme. And this is the Annie Jump Cannon Prize that was awarded to Margaret Harwood. And it turned up with her papers at Radcliffe. Um, so I will, I will make sure that the MMA has a, a picture of this. And um, in recent times, this award is still given. They don't make a pin anymore, unfortunately. After Miss Cannon died, that practice disappeared pretty quickly. But the prize is still given. And there was a lot of discussion about whether today it's still appropriate to have a prize that's only for a woman. And um, here are some of the recent winners. And the, the, the decision was that, yes, it is still important. But to make, to give more stature to the prize, the winner now gives a prize lecture at a meeting of the American Astronomical Society. So there's more to it. And uh, this, is, this is how the plates are stored. This is what the uh, plate stacks look like at Harvard. Um, this is the same young woman in both images, Lindsay Smith Zrule, who was the current curator of astronomical photographs. Miss Fleming's title has always been held by a woman. And um, there are half a million of these plates. It's a uh, unique resource because it represents 100 years of, of the full sky. So each plate is in a paper envelope, and the envelope has information about where it was taken and what were the sky conditions? Uh, and then there are uh, record books that have any notes, any, any important information about any of the work going on, notes on specific plates, uh, just the day-to-day the -day activities in the observatory. And all of the plates are being digitized now because they're, they still have information on them that nobody has ever absorbed. So there's a NSF grant to uh, create the equipment and the manpower, woman power, to uh, digitize the plates. Not all of them, but many of them. Uh, and the, the, the logbooks have all been photographed, and they are on a crowdsourcing website uh, to get people to actually type in what they say. So any of you have time on your hands? That's kind of a worthwhile puzzle solved. 
I'm thinking I should really do it, especially Miss Cannon's books, because now I know how to read her handwriting. So um, it's my last slide. Um, it's obviously a posed image, but here's Margaret Harwood. This is Antonia Mori. This is Cecilia Payne. There are a couple of other Vassar people here. Um, and this is Miss Cannon. See, she's still too busy to look up the picture. And uh, people sometimes ask me, do I, do I want anybody to get a message out of this book? And uh, no, no, I just think it's a ripping good story. And, uh, and it's a true story, which means more than ever in this day and age. Uh, a true story about science, which I'm, I'm so sorry to see gets so little respect in the current administration. So I think um, the more we can tell true stories about science, spread the Mariah Mitchell name, uh, the better things will be. I'll give you, uh, give you one more quote from her to close. I believe in women even more than I do in astronomy. We have, we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Yes, sir. Was it? I'm so glad you asked that question because I forgot to say the most important thing about what she did. The question is, was it Miss Levitt who worked with Hubble? She didn't work with him because she died before she could work with him. But what Miss Levitt did was to show a way to tell distances in space. And using her system, first, Chapley showed how big the Milky Way galaxy was. And it was so gigantic that a lot of astronomers thought it was the sum total of the universe. But Hubble, looking at some of the spiral shapes that could be seen, that, that some people thought were just part of the Milky Way, he suspected they were not. He suspected they were galaxies in their own right. And he saw some of Miss Levitt's stars in, one of the, in the Andromeda galaxy. And using her relationship, was able to prove that it was about 2 million light years away, so far beyond the confines of the Milky Way. So her, um, her work made Hubble's discovery possible. And Hubble later showed that the universe was expanding, that these galaxies are seen rushing away from us, and the farther they are, the faster they seem to go away from us. And that's called Hubble's Law. But now, Ms. Levitt's discovery about the, the changing pattern of the variable stars that made the distance determinations possible, that it used to be called the period luminosity relation, now it's called the Levitt Law. The question over here? Yes. Uh, how do I feel about women's colleges today? Uh, well, when I was a student, I didn't even consider it. And um, I'd always gone to a co-educational school. It just seemed to me that that's the way it should be. But a few years, while I was working on this book, I had a writer-in-residence teaching position at Smith College, which was great because it put me right near Harvard, and I could go back and forth easily. And I finally got it. And I thought, I wish I had it to do over again. Uh, because I think it's really terrific. And I know a lot of the women's colleges have gone co-ed, but I, I still think there's a value to it. Are you a graduate of a, not Holyoke, okay. So you've made some new friends. Okay, anybody else with a question? Okay, oh. Oh, read Miss Maury's poem. Uh, it's very long. 
But I'll just, I'll just pick a few verses. Okay. So first she, she begins describing. She wrote this actually years later when she went back for a reunion, and she was very nostalgic. Verses to the Vassar Dome. A low-built tower and olden, dingy but dear to the sight, and they that dwell therein are wont to watch the stars at night. Uh, now I will skip to... Um, and whether with searching glass I scanned those far deep lanes of night, where stars well up through endlessness in springs of living light, or whether by day I wandered the hills and dales along and heard the veery's wood notes weird and the thrushes' uplifting song. The treasures of earth and heaven I gathered and brought them home. Those gifts of infinite nature found place in that low room. And she really did always encourage them to be looking at nature uh, not just at the stars, but at everything around them. And when she took them to watch the eclipse, she made sure that they were listening for the songs of birds or animal calls that might color the experience for them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.